Good afternoon and welcome on the Sunset Safari. My name is Brent and Jamie's. I have Brian on camera with me today and we have Tara and Andrew in FC and Jess is joining us out and drive this afternoon. So if you guys on the Juma Cam picked up on an extra body on the back, uh, she's getting a chance out of the office and come joining us on the drive. So for those of you who are new, we are live sitting right next to this, these elephants. Isn't that an amazing experience? We're also interactive, so you can ask us questions about what we see on drive. And you can do that by emailing us on questions at wildearth.tv or you can use the hashtag Safari Live on Twitter. So it's really great to be back. Um, I've, James and I have been away for a bit. James is on the other vehicle with Vim. And I'm sure uh, during the course of the drive, we will definitely catch you up on what we were up to. And um, we managed to do about 460 kilometers each on motorcycles. So our back sides are a bit raw. Uh, and you up to date with that. I think we'll look at these eddies a little bit closer. Sides are a bit raw, uh, and you up to date with that? I think we'll look at these eddies a little bit closer. So it's a balmy. Giving the guests from a really good show because they've gone down to see the head. Get a wonderful view. I'm not sure um, if there are guests in camp at the moment. What a fantastic way to come back to a nice little herd of elephants and big elephant. And it's amazing how adaptable these animals are. And she's disappeared. It's good. 30 or so centimeters off a trunk. And she still manages to have an incredible amount of dexterity. Uh, obviously not as much as uh, an elephant with a full trunk, but she has done very, very well. And we've watched her feed. There we go, a nice little bit of dust bathing after a good mud and water bath. And you can see the Juma rooms behind. Wonderful to be back. Chin spot batters calling, elephants dust bathing. Yeah, we can just see her distinct shortened trunk there. Looks like the dust bath's over. And I think that it almost looks to be looking for small tubers in the grass. There we go. So those will hold quite a lot of nutrients and moisture. Uh, just before uh, I left last time, we actually saw a stembok dig probably about 30 centimeters after that. And obviously for an elephant, much easier. And they'll definitely look for bigger tubers and that, especially now at this time of the year where there is a bit of a shortage on food sources. So hanging around in the base of this drainage line, so there will be a little bit of remnant underground water. And you can see there's still a little bit of green in the grass there. So they're taking advantage of that at the moment. 
So from what I heard from Jamie, apparently this this little breeding herd has been hanging around this waterhole quite a bit in the last few days. And it does become quite difficult for elephants at this time of the year. They do tend to lose a little bit of condition and they do have to travel quite big distances between sustainable food sources and water. Now well, they relaxed a bit, I'm going to edge a little bit closer and um, those of you who might be new, it's very important to watch elephant behavior before you approach them too closely, otherwise you can disturb them and potentially put us in a dangerous situation, obviously neither of which we want and you, from their body language you can see they're quite relaxed. As we approach them I've got a, fem a feeling that young female um, who's closest to us might react a little bit of neg negatively, she might open up her ears. She's done that to me before when I've seen her. She tends to be a little bit less relaxed, but in these circumstances you need to watch the adult female and you judge the rest of the herd's behavior on her behavior, but she will be giving the signals whether they should attack or not. But let's go see a bit closer and see what we can see if they were. Oh, excuse me. See if we can see what they're feeding on. Also put the car into low range so the engine makes a lot less noise and we can really just inch up there. Also, you don't want to drive directly at the animals. You want to drive sort of straight across the face of them. Driving directly at a lot of animals, uh, depending on how relaxed they are, can sometimes be taken as a sort of semi-aggressive stance. It's important to keep your movements very slow and steady with elephants. Here we go, she's giving us a little head shake, but as you can see, the back is, is still completely fine. Here we go, kicking a little bit of sand at us, but she should calm down relatively quickly. It looks like she has more interested in finding those little bulbs that she seems to, that all the Ellie's here seem to be feeding on. So those of you who own motor vehicles will know, generally if you have a dark car, it tends to get quite a lot hotter uh, than a, a sort of a white car, a light colored car. And that's where elephants are quite a strange, strange thing, is that they're one of the only animals outside of us human beings that are able to operate at full capacity during the hottest days. And being a dark animal, one would think that would be sort of improbable because they're likely to overheat or whatnot. And their ears are the reason they've developed this amazing cooling system. And they can have eight liters, um, which is almost two gallons. Uh, for those of you in the northern, uh, northern hemisphere or the northern United States and Canada, um, they can have almost two gallons of blood in their ears. And that warm blood gets pumped into a huge, huge vascular system that's in their ears. And when they flap it, it cools down and then sent back through the body. So that's how they're able to maintain and deal with this incredible heat. Obviously having a nice mud bath as well helps. You can see I really enjoyed the water. So all these elephants look in quite nice condition. There we can see after those bulbs. some of the sand and then we can actually see that trunk a little bit more carefully there and that's a testament to how incredibly strong and what uh, the, the survival instinct is in these animals Give 
some of the sand. And then we can actually see that chunk a little bit more carefully there. And that's a testament to how incredibly strong and what uh, the, the survival instinct is in these animals uh, and and the incredible injuries that they have. I know she's been seen on, on the wild earth safaris for a while but where or how long ago it happened that she might have lost that piece of her trunk unfortunately I haven't heard any deeper information about it but it probably was a very long time ago judging from how it's healed and I'm not sure whether a vet was called to intervene. Sometimes in these situations, the real bad damage is already done and she would have pulled through the, uh, that pulled the snare off and that piece of her trunk would have fallen off and it would have naturally healed, but it would have been a very difficult time for, time for her to feed. I mean, the trunk is such a vital part of an elephant. I mean, drinking, eating, It is amazing how they are able to survive such, what we would often consider such huge injuries. I don't know if you guys can hear that in the background. And that's a tiny little, one of my favorite birds out here. It's an African barred owl that we can hear calling. Everybody, um, uh, that was a quite a fast changeover to us. It's lovely to be back. Um, just reattaching my earpiece and uh, feeling slightly flustered at being so, 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 so quickly thrown on camera. VM, how are you doing today? Okay? Yeah, okay, good. There we go. No, I'm calm. I'm all right. So, on camera today, we have Viam. You are most welcome. My name is James Hendry, in case you have forgotten me or in case you perhaps have joined us in the last seven days. And if you are, you are even more welcome than everyone else. Well, that's not true. Everyone's as welcome as each other. Let's not get any jealousy going around the welcomeness of everyone. We do love to hear from you. Questions at wildearth.tv if you're on the email or uh, hashtag Safari Live if you're on the tweet tweet. Um, I am driving around at the moment just about near where Brent was, around Gauri Waterhole, and we're trying to find tracks of Kurula. Now, Kurula, for those who don't know, is a female leopard, roughly 11 years of age, um, who I unfortunately called pug Face at one stage and nearly caused Twitter to shut down. She is a beautiful leopard, make no mistake. She's just got a slightly shorter nose than some of the others I've seen. So we're driving around here and we're looking for tracks. Stefan found some very fresh tracks this morning and they apparently headed into this area. I haven't seen any hide nor hair of them yet, but there have been a whole lot of buffalo in the area and so they may have stomped out the tracks. Um, there are impala, warthog, uh, nyala, various bits and pieces around the place. And so we'll drive along and see what we can have a look at. We've dri driven through here, we're gonna t we've turned around, we're going to come back around here and see if we can't pick up the tracks. Okay, welcome back to all of you and uh, I suppose to me. Thank you. Here we go. I must just tell you, Brent and I had a magnificent trip. We were up on the corner of Zimbabwe, Botswana and um, South Africa and there is a huge amount of history in the area, there's a massive amount of wildlife and there's also some of the most incredible vistas I have yet to see on this fine continent of ours. So I can well remain, recommend a visit up there, Mashatu in Botswana or the Greater Mapunguba Transfrontier Conservation Area, say that after a couple of, uh, couple of uh, snifters. And that's just on the sort of southern, south western side of Zimbabwe and then into northern South Africa, a little place called Mapungugwe, which is the site of a very sort of mysterious African civilization that existed there around 900 AD and they were goldsmiths, very fine goldsmiths and they traded, they think, 
as far east as the Chinese. They didn't travel there, but the Chinese, we think, came here. Um, certainly the Middle Easterns came here, and they found Chinese beads and various kinds of Middle Eastern artifacts around Mapungubwe, uh, which is a beautiful site on the Limpopo River, just to the very northern side of South Africa. So, oh, oh, hang on a second, Yompi. There she is. She's come down this way. Oh. All right, um, there are some tracks here of a female leopard. I think it's Karula. They're not very clear, so I'm not going to try and point them out to you on the camera and embarrass myself. We're going to send you back to Brent. He's apparently managed to fix his gremlins and the elephants. And I'm going to have a quick look here and I'll tell you about them when you come back. See you just now. Welcome back, everyone. Sorry about that. It seems like there's a gremlin this little drainage line in front of uh, Juma Vuyatela Lodge. But we are back and we have a question from Mavis, uh, specifically with this elephant who's got the stumpy trunk. And Mavis would like to know why isn't she with uh, a bigger breeding herd? Uh, Mavis, I've actually seen her as part of a bigger breeding herd of about 35 uh, individuals, but most of the time I have seen her with these two slightly young animals. And what happens, and specifically at this time of the year, that elephants do congregate in some of those bigger herds, but they also do split off. Obviously, in a bigger herd, it's a, a lot more difficult to find food, and there's a lot more competition. But what happens is when you do see these very big herds, sometimes of 100 or so elephants together, that will be actually made up of a whole bunch of smaller family units that are most probably more than likely related, so sort of cousins, aunties, uncles, and they will join up from time to time and sort of have a catch-up and a, a good chin wag and then you'll often notice that quite often the smaller little family groups will then peel off from the larger group and i think maybe because she does have this uh, stumpy trunk she will spend a little bit more time away from those bigger groups where there's less competition for food and she's able to take her time a bit more with feeding things in bad condition and there we can see her uh, she's managed to learn to use that trunk and that, and that is quite a disadvantage you can see she's not nearly nearly as dexterous as uh, an indicator um, if an elephant's in bad condition also the hip bones so you can see when the elephants start losing condition you start to notice these sort of depressed depressions in their skulls and you don't really see ribs unless it's really towards the end but their, their back, back hip bone will start showing, you'll have depressions around there. And you can see the skin looks very good there. She looks in, in, in very good condition. And we are at, at the, one of the driest times of the year. So I think she's doing just fine and she's found her little niche to be able to, to survive. And uh, I'm sure she will meet up and we probably will see her with bigger breeding herds at some, time, at some point in time. But I think for the moment her strategy is it's easier to feed while by herself and not having competition from the other animals. So these Ellie's are going to move further out in front of the lodge and uh, as far as I understand there might be some people in the rooms down there so we're not going to move too much further down here. We're going to make our way out. I'm going to see if I can get reacquainted with Juma. Hopefully I won't get lost. But if I do, Brian's here to set me straight. So hopefully no getting lost today. Bye bye Ellie Finks.
So Brian, do you remember the way it's bubbles like that? So it is really nice and warm today. So I definitely think my game plan will be to check the various water points around Juma. And I'm sure those of you who've been watching the Juma cam will have seen that wonderful saddle wolf stalk just down here. So we're gonna visit the saddle wolf stalk. So the saddle wolf stalks we see around here um, or certainly up here, uh, even though we only see one, and sometimes we only see one at a time, but they will sort of dominate the, the drying water holes in this area and utilize the different water holes uh, as a pair or as individuals, but they are, they are definitely a pair. Hi, Siba Sisu from Hammond's Kral. It's quite warm outside Pretoria today as well. You're also sitting at around 30 degrees, so I'm sure you're enjoying the same sunny South African weather that we are here. So as we left those elephants next to that electric fence around the lodge, and that's obviously to keep the elephants and buffalo and other things out of the lodge and the guests safe, uh, Sibo Siso would like to know if they ever get electrocuted by uh, those fences, um, or are they immune because of their thick skins? And is there any part of an elephant's body that's a bit softer? Well, Sibo Siso, they do get shocked by them, but no means electrocuted. Uh, so with an electric fence like that, a game fence, they're normally at about 12,000 volts amperage. So high amperage, and that would kill you, but you can have a high voltage and a low amperage, so it gives them a fright. It definitely does give them a shock. And most of these elephants would have learned by testing those fences at some point in their life, and they would have got a wallop, and now they tend to stay away from them. Uh, and there are softer parts of an elephant's skin, sort of under their arms and that, but nothing that we would really consider really soft, like our skin or whatnot. It's still very, very coarse and, and hard and grainy. There we go. So guys, we have the saddle stalk in front of us. And now, let's wait for Brian to get it in a bit tighter. And I'm going to ask you, is this a male saddle stalk? Or is it a female saddlewood stalk? Just to see that you guys, that Jamie and Steph have been keeping you guys up to date and checking on you. Um, is it a male or female saddlewood stalk? You can send your answers through to questions at wildearth.tv or use the hashtag Safari Live on Twitter. I think quite shortly the Juma Dam is going to start looking very similar to what Twin Dams is and very, very dry and very little water. I did see some catfish moving as we approached and there's probably still some tilapia in here and that's what the Saddlewood Stalk is, is taking advantage of. It's going to be much easier for them to catch well, frogs and fish in a drying up puddle than it is in a full dam. Then we can see a little bit of ripples in the water from the catfish to the left. Those look a bit big for that stalk. Oh, there's a nice big group of Inyala coming in right behind the stalk. So as we get down to the cooler in the evening, the Nyala will start moving out of the thickets. I think they're probably coming to take advantage of that water hole that the Ellies were drinking at earlier. So let's move around and see if they come drink.
it doesn't look like we're moving very far without, fi without finding lots today. That's a, always a good way to start. I always love starting with elephants. So where James and I have just been in an area called the Tumi Conservation Area. There were lots of elephants. We didn't see too many of them from our motorbikes. Um, but the guys in the helicopter were running the safety over the cycle race. Uh, so we actually a herd of about 300 on the first day on the... motorbikes. Really, I'm not sure 100% why. I think it's probably something to do with the noise a bit. And I did get chased by one young bull uh, on the third day of... Is it the third day? Yes, the third day of riding through the bush. I was going on a long straight road through Mapani woodland and I just heard this and this young bull running out to chase me. So we're going to just pop ourselves opposite and try to get on the right side of the sun. So you guys might be able to get some really nice screenshots as these Inyala make their way down to drink. What are you doing, Brian, around here? So they're still a little bit off, but they, what Brian's going to show you now, they are moving down towards the water. But as always, animals could prove me completely wrong and walk straight past the water. And they have a different agenda to the one I think they do. I can see this. I can see four females and one male there. And a squirrel in the foreground just in front. Oh, she's going to walk towards the squirrel now. Very carefully approaching, making sure there's no predators around. You can see her ears are out fanning for any noises, She's probably testing the wind. Looking out for Madame Karula. See how she's lifting her nose into the wind there and very, very alert before approaching the water hole. See they're all far more alert now. I think the male is more interested in the ladies. I'm just judging from his behavior. There's another little boy with him there. It's amazing that that complete color morph um, that the and Yala go through, so there's a young male, and you can see he still very much looks like mom. And it's starting to darken around the neck, and you can see his horns haven't even started to curl yet. And you notice how an animal like an Inyala approaches, as opposed to how an animal like an elephant or a buffalo approach. So obviously Inyala being smaller, far more cautious. They take their time as they approach the water hole. Whereas the elephants sort of stampede in with great excitement into the water and so do big herds of buffalo. One of my favorite sayings. 
patience is one of the most important things on safari. So we're definitely going to sit here. I'm, I'm quite confident they're going to come drink at this water hole. It might take them a little bit longer to get here, but I definitely think it's worth the wait, especially as the, the light is getting better as we move later into the afternoon. They seem to be a little bit more happy now. They've had a good look around. And we are going to notice something, and I'm sure you guys who watch the Juma cam regularly have noticed how the elephants often go for that top little corner where the water is pumped. So there's nice fresh water, cleaner water than the rest. And this little Nyala looks like it's going to do exactly the same. And you see, even approaching a small little bit of water like this, they're quite, quite cautious. And uh, we're looking around in case there might be other predators or even a crocodile. Even a small little pan like this can hold a crocodile. See how she lifted her head quickly there, just in, in case there was something around. You watch sounds from all different directions. So in Yala, non-territorial animals, they will stay in sort of home ranges, but they're very loose. And you'll often find mixed groups of males and females, and multiple males together. You can see, there we go. That's why I said, I think he's more interested in the ladies. Oh, off she goes. And I think that was him harassing her that got her to run away. There we go, off they head off, back to the thickets along the drainage line. Don't think she's quite an estrus yet, and definitely not too interested in the invitations from the male. But she probably is coming towards estrus, and that's why he's hanging around, and we'll be following her quite extensively. Anyway, now let's go and try and move away and see what else we can find. We haven't gone very far at all yet, the Sunset Safari. But isn't that wonderful? There's so much happening and there's always wonderful things to look at out here in the African bush. I'm just going to get a hold of James on the radio. Ah, and see what else he's been up to. But um, we're going to cross across to James, who is also at a hydration point. And we'll be back with you a little later, hopefully. Uh, we're going to see what we can find in the sort of north and east of the, the reserve and have some fun with James. I'm sure he's got lots to tell you and we've both got a lot to catch up on, but we'll see you later. Hello everybody. Welcome back to Wendy where I bring you the news that I'm afraid we have not found uh, the delightful Karula just yet. But what we have found is uh, something akin to the bush version of a monastery for old men. Here are a number of buffalo bulls, uh, lots of them, and they seem to be lurking about here in the dust, uh, lying in their own detritus, and um, also being attacked by probably one billion flies. It's very hot today, 
and they are lurking around the water here probably because they've denuded the other water hole and you'll find now that competition is going to start to increase substantially so while you've had elephants at the other water hole which is where Brent is and that's as the crow flies probably about that 150 meters you'll find that as the competition increases things like elephants will start to dominate water holes like that so the buffalo will move over they'll be forced to move around a bit so these guys are lying around here this is not their preferred sort of place because there's no mud for them and they do like the mud when it gets hot like this Ooh, really lovely query from Dennis in Massachusetts. And Dennis, thank you for your kind welcoming of me back. I see that no one yet on the Twitterverse has noticed my spanky new shirt, which is quite insulting. I'm a bit sad about that. Anyway, uh, Dennis, your question is an excellent one, and I'm not sure I have the answer. Uh, Dennis wants to know, why is it that there are so many flies on the lions and the buffalo when the elephants seem to be relatively free of them? Dennis, the same goes for rhino, you know, they're all over rhino as well. And I don't think it's a coincidence that ox peckers are on all of the animals you've mentioned, except lions, of course, which would uh, eat ox peckers, um, and not on elephants, which also seem to be free of the scourge of flies that are around the place. Dennis, I think it's probably got something to do with elephants not tolerating them. Elephants, if you watch them carefully, they're very seldom still, like these buffalo are for any length of time. And so every time a buffalo moves, you see this cloud of flies leap off them. Uh, same with a rhino. Elephants, I think, move a bit more. I also think they do things like throw dust on themselves quite a lot, which tends probably to chase the flies off. So yeah, Dennis, I think those are probably the reasons. But remember also, Dennis, that the elephants are not, they won't tolerate ox peckers either. So while they do get ticks on them, I don't think nearly as many as some of the other animals like rhino and buffalo, uh, they will not tolerate ox peckers. And we're not really sure why that is. I don't think they're nearly as affected as ec by ectoparasites as things like elephants are though, at least as things like buffalo and rhino are because their skins are just so incredibly thick. Very nice question. So a huge group of bulls, and I've never seen groups of bulls like I have here at Juma. I, I'm not sure why we don't see as many breeding herds. There are at least two breeding herds that live south and to the north of here, and they just don't seem to come through here very often. I mean, every so often we've seen, we've seen the Nkohuma pride killing out of a buffalo herd here before, but we haven't seen, we don't see them very often. And it's not because there isn't water here. I mean, there's fairly, fairly large amount of water. Now, I believe you have had a few sightings of the breeding herd in the last week. Okay, so maybe as the water dries up in some of the other areas, they'll come through here more often. So this old monastery of bulls, you can see some of them much older than others. Um, the, um, if you, there's that one with a half a horn there. Can you see him? desert there he is so you've got everything from that age he's probably pushing 25 um, all the way down to well they look like a couple of them that could be sort of almost in their prime that one in the center of your picture there now has got a very good boss on his head and he looks like he's got a great set of horns on him and so I'd say he's probably not much older than maybe 18 I am guessing but I think he's a bit younger than the others. It just goes to show that the, the fittest bulls are probably less than 18, probably sort of 14 or 15 years, and after that their condition probably starts to decline steadily, and it becomes more of an effort to fight for the attentions of the beautiful buffalo ladies that tend to move around in the breeding herds. And so they come and form these sort of old boys clubs where they can tell each other stories of their days of glory and lie in the mud and their own detritus of course
lovely the picture of the dust rising up off them and that's going to be an increasing sight as we go into the driest parts of the season where Brent and I were recently all were almost at least just as dry as this if not drier in some places and apparently the place where we were in Botswana which is called the Thule block apparently Thule does have some kind of meaning to do with dust in the Tswana language or one of the local languages there and it certainly was extremely dusty even more dusty than this is so tough times out for the animals and the wildlife of this area for the next few months and like I've said before we are expecting a dry year and so probably quite tough all the way into December Right, so we drove all the way around here trying to see if we could find anything in the way of tracks of Karula. She did come into the sort of drainage line area. I'm not sure if many of you, any of you saw it, but a little while back, Brent managed to catch her in a tree just not far from here, and Mvula stole a kill from her, which was extremely um, unchivalrous of him, but he did do that, and that wasn't far from where we are sitting right now. But her tracks haven't come out anywhere, and she does a few different things which is quite interesting. She goes through the camps and so we wouldn't pick her tracks up there and she also does things like she moves in the middle of the day. It looks to me like she's been moving around in the middle of the day which is, I mean it's not totally unusual for leopard but she seems to do it more than most. So I think we're going to stay around this area today and see if she doesn't pop out. I think monkeys are going to be our best bet. Alarm calling monkeys probably. But we'll see, nothing's shouting right now.
book you've got a nice little family to work it out and how is it lucky that is the saddle stalk is the family so it makes it a lot easier and quicker to utilize the book obviously with birding sometimes you don't get the longest possible time to have a look at the bird before it fits off so this is just to help with the speedy finding of the birds in the book so there we go stalks so we can't actually see here it's not the best picture but the male has a red eye and the female has a yellow eye and also the male which isn't actually pictured here has very distinct wattles that hang off the bottom of the beak but the females aren't as distinct but obviously they haven't pictured the male fully here and um, this book um, is my favorite although a lot of it it's a bit big for this area but it covers birds in the whole of Africa South Africa I've been using it quite extensively but a lot of the books for this part of the world wouldn't cover where I was in Zambia recently so always good to I like to keep that with me so while we continue to traverse the eastern sectors of Ajuma private game reserve we're going to cross back to Commander Bond uh, who's with some striped donkeys. Hello everybody, welcome back to Wendy where we have found a zebra or two, there are actually two of them, and I think they're coming down to the, to the water hole to drink. It's been a very hot day, like I said, and it's so seldom that zebra actually come towards us, and I, I, these are some of my favorite animals. I was a big fan of horses as a kid, and so stripy ones out here are just magnificent, especially when they're being confining, they won't like this young fellow is. Fellow Vian? No. Lady. Beautiful. Gee, that's a really nice picture. We don't often get them this sort of close and happy to be around us. There's another one coming. So before I move, we'll wait for him or her. You can so clearly see there the difference in their stripes. And people will often say to you, you know, zebras have all unique stripes. Isn't that amazing? I think it'd be far more amazing if they had the same stripes. That's quite an old mare. You can see she's just a bit bony. She's got a very interesting stripe pattern. She's an oldish, oldish mare. Let's go around to the water and see if I can't get them having a bit of a drink. And I did get an update on Karula's tracks and Lee, who I'm sure you've, we've spoken about before, um, who operates a sort of training school around the place, said that they did cross off towards Quarantine Clearing, which is away from here. So we'll head that way. He didn't find her, so we'll head that way a little bit later. But let's go up onto the wall here and see if the zebra don't come down to drink. In fact, we'll go down below the wall. Everything's thirsty, including me, Viam. What did you bring me to drink? Uh, banana peel water. Banana peel water, thank you. There you go, away for a week and expect everybody to welcome you back with gifts of, I don't know, all sorts of nice things. Banana peel water. Thanks, Vian. Actually, where are you going? Is it? Right, we're just going to stop here. I don't want to get the driver on too close to them. That said, if they do come down the other side, we won't see them. Let's just drive around here and we'll wait and see for a while if they come. And if they don't, we'll head back towards quarantine clearings. Lots of catfish activity. And as some of you know, um, I have failed. I'm a dismal catfish catcher. To try. There's also a beautiful saddle with stork, who seems to have lost her partner yet again. Here come the zebra. I'm sure they'll come down. We'll just wait here for a little while. No, 
I believe Brent did do a quiz on the gender of that stalk. So you all know what it is. But what's interesting to me is that she seems to be on her... So that's a he. So that's very interesting. So the last time the stalk was on its own here, it was definitely the female. And they are monogamous pairs. And so I'm quite fascinated that the other one isn't here. Maybe she's gone off to Twin Dam. No, Viam says Twin Dam is totally dry now. Maybe Treehouse Dam. And maybe she's doing some fishing there. I suspect also that most of these sort of edible sized tilapia have been eaten out of this water and they're now probably catfish that are just probably easy to catch but they're so big come this sort of time of the year and this stage of the water that that stalk is not going to do a huge amount of eating of those huge fish. Zebra are So just while we wait for the zebra, which are just behind me over there, Lisa, nice question about, you see, you've noticed how much more to know the sort of smell, there's this sort of a, a muddy stink around the rotting buffalo dung and different other kinds of you know, fish detritus perhaps that's in the water. Yes, it does a little bit, not very strongly though. I think because it dries so quickly, not much really gets a chance to rot, I think. Uh, but Biffelsook is so much deeper because it's excavated, so it's got a much bigger wall than this, and so it's, and it doesn't seem to be fed by a much bigger drainage line, but it definitely holds a lot more water, and it's a lot deeper in the middle than this ever gets. There's the zebra, Vian. Can you see them? They are now frightened of you, Viam. You frightened them away. All right, so Cam is water where we spent quite a long time already, and we'll head back around towards. They're walking away. They are now frightened of you, Viam. You frightened them away. All right, so Cam is water where we spent quite a long time already and we'll head back around towards quarantine clearings and see if we can't pick just our feeling about this place we'll pop down here a bit later in the evening there are the elephants that Brent saw we shan't tarry but I'll just have a look they are. And he's looking for the luxury, perhaps a bit of cleaner vegetable. A bit of um, to eat, I suppose. Lovely light there. Just as the light starts to soften today. The other thing I noticed, speaking of sort of softening and that color, that sort of yellowish color, which is of... Um, sort of like a gentle creamed honey color is the knob thorns the knob thorns have started to flower and they smell amazing and they've got those sort of gentle patches of they look like little balls of creamed honey on the end of the leaf of the end of the branches just a beautiful smell this time of the year and the first hint of the new season well, here come the zebra vium and don't frighten them away again
I just spotted the elephants. No. They decided they're not that terrifying. She's going to brave Viem and I, rather. Well, two mammal species in the same picture. In fact, there actually there were three for one second. There is a Nyala that you can maybe just see. There we've got three species briefly. Beautiful. Look at that. She's a stunning zebra, that. I think this is a younger mare. The other one that we saw seems to be, to me, much older than this one. She's just sniffing the air, listening carefully to what we're saying. Obviously not um, the words, necessarily. <laughs> They don't like people much. They, they're quite nervous. And clearly, our presence here is not frightening enough to overcome the thirst. actually a young stallion that's not a that's not a mare that's a mare the other one is a young stallion I think they're going up to the cleaner water very aware sniffing all the time this is so nice we seldom spend this sort of time with zebra Well, of course, what they're doing, they're sniffing this old elephant dung that's on the ground. And I, sometimes they will eat it if it's, I don't know when, but zebra will also eat their own dung in diff difficult times. It's a process called coprophagy. Yeah, pretty foul, if you ask me, but some animals, some herbivores do do it. And horses do it as well, especially if they're trying to reline their guts with the bacteria that help them to digest the cellulose. Stalin smelling all the time. And superbly designed fly swatter on his backside is constant work. Look at them both swishing. I'm just going to try and sneak around. Just try not to let them run off. Very lovely, peaceful afternoon, this. Lovely to be back in the low felt after the northern reaches of South Africa.
apparently you had quite a long discussion this morning with Jamie about the um, hiccuping of zebra and you didn't come to any conclusion. Um, I have spent an extensive time with horses and as far as I know no horse I was ever privileged to ride hiccuped. They do cough and their coughs do sometimes sound like hiccups but um, I'm not sure where the discussion came from or if there is in fact some kind of conclusive proof either way that zebra hiccup. As far as I understand it a hiccup is a sort of spasm in the diaphragm and I'm not sure that zebras have them. Very thirsty. And just quite interestingly while you're looking at that animal sucking up water. Something that I certainly when I first heard this was amazed by it but it's so obvious when you know and that is the function of lips. If you don't have lips you can't do what these zebras are doing now. See that film? It is impossible to make a any kind of suction or any kind of sort of airtight or vacuum in the mouth and so it's almost impossible to drink like that. Well you can't drink like that. It's one of the major functions of having lips that close and seal off the mouth. A really nice Natal Franklin there. Oh no, going away. Never mind. Well, let us leave these zebras to their drinks and I think we'll head back towards quarantine clearings and see if we can't pick up on Karula's tracks again. And then while we're driving, there is a young stallion here and a mare and the one just in front of your screen there is in fact Could the youngster be her son, or is he her lover, perhaps? Robin, um, most likely her son, but not impossible that they could have hooked up in a romantic sense. Um, age is not, they're, they're not very ageist zebras, and obviously the mares are, will breed basically until they die, and so it would be very advantageous to both of them if they happen to find themselves alone and without, um, without romantic partners. It would be very advantageous for both of them to hook up, and so maybe that's what happened. Um, I don't know. She looks like she might be pregnant, you know, so maybe they have created a small partnership. A small kinship group is what they're called. As we've left that lonely stork, who's a little bit like the Bachelor of Biffle's Hook in that he's on his own. Um, Kathleen, you want to know where they make their nests. Storks make their nests in trees, sticks, sort of uncomfortable stick nests, a bit like a, if you, the most obvious sort of example would be like an eagle's nest. I'm sure you can imagine an eagle's nest, a sort of uncomfortable platform of sticks. Um, all of them except something called a black stork. The black stalk that we do the rest of them were in rocks in trees. I've always been um, some some birds nests you would really like to spend some time in. They look really comfortable, especially the nest of something like the grey penduline tit, which is a tiny little bird like that. And they make a 
a nest of hair. They get, um, they, they take cotton. They take wild cotton from a plant called Gisipium herbaceum. And they, they take that and they take various other bits, of probably a few feathers and fibers. And they make this sort of, uh, it looks like a cocoon. And it's got a special false entrance to stop snakes going in and ate, eating the babies. It's a remarkable construction. If I, I mean, when we find them, they really are very special. And if you were a young bird, that's where you'd want to grow up. And then you look at something like a white-backed vulture's nest, which is a great big pile of untidy and uncomfortable thorny knob-thorn sticks. And you think, with grief, how horrible it must be to be born in that, naked, uh, with no covering at all and being expected to survive. I breathe them tough as vultures. So Karula went through basically from my from behind us and then down through past there's a little site where one of her sons was once found, a bri a sort of dinner site on a on a concrete plinth where one of her sons was once found reclining. Was it, do you remember that, Bjorn? Uh, Scott and Brian? Scott and Brian, with quarantine, I Long think. Ago, yeah. yeah. Long ago. And the leopard was resting on the top of the plinth, and that's basically where she's gone. So we're going to go down and check towards the drainage line that runs away from here. We may be lucky, we may not. But it is a magnificent afternoon just to be out here. And while all the people that Brendan and I were working with have headed back to the, the big smoke of Johannesburg, which at this time of the year is really not too bad. Um, they were all going into their offices today and Brent and I, they, you know, they were asking where were Brent and I going and we said, well, we're going back to work. And they said, well, well, where's that? And we said, well, it's in the middle of the Kruger National Park. And their faces almost universally turned green with envy as they thought about their days in the office today. Sorry if you happen to be in an office, but if you are in an office, remember that um, there's nothing wrong with having this Wild Earth production showing just in the little bottom left-hand corner of your screen. Alternatively, if you're in an office of your own and not a cubicle, then you should probably have it projected onto the wall in life size. Let me try that starling. It's going to get a little... Mm. No? It's too far, is it? It was a greater blue-eared glossy starling, everybody. We'll just have a quick look. Totally nondescript at this angle with this light. Well, there you go. You can see he's blue and you can see a slight yellow tinge of his eye. And remember, there are two species of starling that look almost identical to that one. The one is that one, the greater, um, the Cape Glossy Starling. The other is the greater blue eared Glossy Starling. And that one is at Cape Glossy. I know that only from his call that he made as he flew off. He went, boodle 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 boodle. Did you hear that, Ben? Hmm? Did you hear him saying, boodle boodle boodle? Uh, No, I wasn't listening. No, you weren't listening. See, that's the problem with these chaps. And that is how I knew he was a Cape Glossy Starling, because they look almost identical to the greater blue-eared starling, which goes blue when he calls. That's how I remember the difference. It doesn't actually sound like that, but to my mind it does. Material line, and they certainly didn't like them. So there are no tracks coming out here at the moment. I also believe that you had some incredible sightings of the Birmingham boys and that they have in fact killed the Styx cubs. Um, I think all three of them. Viam, is it all three or just two of them? Two. two. So tremendously tumultuous and sad times. And I believe also that the Matimbas have sort of disappeared with their tails between their legs. I must say, I think that's happened much faster than I thought it was going to. 
So the Birmingham fellows are obviously quite formidable. It's not to say the Matimbas won't come back, but I think it's probably unlikely at this stage. So I would away. So I'd love to hear your thoughts on it actually. Um, any of you who perhaps have some thoughts on what's happened or why it's happened and um, what's going to happen, that's the most interesting thing. Uh, please send them through. It'd be fascinating to know what you guys who've been watching this area for so long think is going to happen with the, with the line dynamics. sure this is nothing beyond but I'm going to look sorry there's just something I can see there on a termite mound and interestingly it is also a piece of termite mound how unusual to find a piece of termite mound on a termite mound. Sorry about that, Viam. I don't mean to waste your time. I was hoping it was Karula reclining gently. Oh well. close to Shadow's territorial boundary here, which is quite interesting. Now just before I left, I drove along here and I smelt that glorious smell of knobthorn flowers and I'm hoping that I'm going to do it again and we're going to find the tree that was it's just starting to flower. And I don't see one around here. Quickly look here, we at this knob thorn here. So there we have a knob thorn tree. Uh, which is not particularly impressive at this time of the year, but you must just keep an eye out as we drive around over the next few days and weeks. They will start to flower, that sort of light yellow, creamed honey sort of coloured flower. Beautiful smelling. Now while we looking at this knobthorn tree, I believe Brent has managed to get himself from Biffleshook Dam all the way to Arethusa Waterhole, which is a feat of driving uh, that the, the great Carlos Sainz would have been uh, proud and so we'll get, head across to him and I will see you just now. Welcome back guys, I saw I've meandered from the far east to the far west and I'm sitting at the Arethusa waterhole at the moment and uh, there's some hippos but being quite a warm day they're safely esconded under the weed in the water and we'll have a look at them now hopefully they're going to come out of the water a bit but it's always good at this time of the year to check up on all the water points and you never know what you might be able to find especially now as it gets cooler I don't think Shadow and Cindy have been seen in a few days, so I was hoping maybe 
They might be around here. I'm definitely going to meander up towards Red Dam and check around there. I know Jamie had some luck while we were away in that area with uh, Sindilo. Also, uh, the vultures should have babies by now and there's a vulture's nest really nice and close to the, to the road to the west of us that I'm definitely going to have a look at. But um, quite a serene setting here at the Arethusa waterhole. And the hippos hiding from the sun. And about to fly into frame to the right. Here we go, over the hippos. Blacksmith lapwing. A very fast turtle dove as well. Always good to stop and listen, see if we can pick up some alarm calls or any sound that might give away the presence of an animal. But nothing so far, so I think we're going to meander on. Just some gardeners keeping the Arethusa grounds in pristine condition. And the amazing thing about safari lodges is that it all seems so seamless when you visit them. But when you're out on drive, there's a whole team of people you hardly see uh, who make everything look wonderful. Another reason I've come to the far west is I'm secretly hoping to bump into the Anderson male leopard who I haven't seen yet. Oh, hello. Hello. And as it gets warmer, the flies are starting to get quite bad. And you can see that zebra's tail working over time to keep the flies away. Looks like we have two young, young bucks, young stallions there that are out on their own away from the harems because the big stallions will keep chasing them. We'll leave them to meander off and we're going to go check the Marakele drainage line. Hopefully we find something around there. drive away from those zebras we've got quite an interesting question about zebras why do, why do the zebra it's from Terry in Terry I'm not hundred percent sure to be honest I'm gonna think about this for a while but when zebras do lose condition uh, their manes do fall down but I'm not sure why they stand upright as they do and obviously think of a horse obviously the mane falls and flows quite low down so if anyone out there has heard of possibly why, uh, for a reason that the zebra mane stands upright, um, you can please let me know and you can do that by emailing us some questions at wildearth.tv or you can use the hashtag Safari Live on Twitter. So he's been a big herd of Ellie's down the road here. Going towards the dam, I didn't see any tracks coming on the road. We approached the dam, so they possibly have headed off to the south. So 
we're making a concerted effort to check all the water points. So from just check how much the levels have changed since I've been away. I think the Arethusa water will be a noticeable change in the dam or the Juma Dam and in Buffalo's Hook. And I'm very interested to see where the Red Dam, which we're just going to slowly make our way towards, has still got water in it. And uh, Julia from Houston was wondering whether there's less water plants in the, in the dams. Well, Julia, a lot of those aquatic plants, I wouldn't say there's less, they're just probably more thickly populated at the moment. And they will make a big, quick recovery once the rains come. But I do say, as I said before, we are in a very dry, I think we are in the beginning of a very dry cycle. So we're not going to have as much rain as we have had for the last few years. And I know a lot of people get a bit worried. It is not a bad thing. It is a natural thing. In this part of, in this part of the world, on average, it, your cycles work in about seven years cycles, seven years wet, seven years dry. Uh, that also help different animals in different bush, just depending. You're quite often that the elephants will open up a lot more areas because they're feeding off a lot more trees during these dry cycles and that's good for the grasses and good for animals like zebra and wildebeest uh, who are grazers so and then in a couple of years it'll change again and the elephants will focus more on the grass so it is a natural cycle and i wouldn't worry and it's how nature controls itself so any animal that's slightly weak or, or injured and especially now where well, there's a lot less food and water around will be easy pickings for the predators so that helps keep the whole population as a whole very healthy so now we're driving on the edge of the Murakele drainage so I'm just going to sit up on my door and one little thing about if you know oh have I got it in the right gear that's the question if you can get these vehicles into the right gear I don't even have to use my feet on the pedals all the gears and we can just drive along and it gives me a height that I can look down into the drainage line and as a lot of our regular viewers will know, drainage lines are a great place to look for things like leopards. And so that little bit of height helps me get my eyes scanning a bit better. And fortunately, I've got Brian, who's also got eagle eyes with me, and he can check behind me if there's anything that side. Trying to remember the last really lovely leopard sighting I had on this drainage line was of, of Tingana on an Impala kill. But that was quite some time ago. I know Scott's seen the Anderson mail. Quite often, if you guys are new viewers, you'll quite often notice me look down onto the road. And what I'm doing is looking for the footprints of animals and to try to figure out what's been around. And if you are, are new, we are completely live. So you are seeing whatever I'm seeing out here in the African bush at the exact same time. And we're also interacting, so you're able to ask me questions about what we're seeing. And you can do that by emailing us in questions at wildearth.tv or you can use the hashtag Safari Live if you're a Twitterfarian. But it is so great to be back and as amazing as the areas that uh, James and I visited re recently and completely different sort of ecosystems to here, much more arid. So we saw some animals that I know a lot of you live safarians would love to see on game drive here like eland. We saw a lot of eland up there and they do prefer quite often those more arid areas and we got to travel through some of the most picturesque areas I've been to in a long time. The huge sandstone cliffs and caves and Bushman paintings. Very interesting area historically as well um, with the Boer War and some of the Indovele or Matabili Wars that the British had with the Matabili tribe and uh, in Botswana land works a little bit different to what it does in a lot of places so all land in Botswana and most African countries for that matter is owned by the government and even your house you have on a 99 year lease. So there are only three areas in Botswana where this does not happen and that one area is the Tuli block where we were and you are allowed to have free title and own 
your own land there and that was an agreement from the great chief karma and he made his part for then sort of boers pushing into his territory so he decided it would be better to have a bit of the british empire in that area than have the the boers and so he made a deal with cecil john rhodes um, cecil john rhodes actually attempted something called the jamison raid through that area named after leander star jamison who was actually a doctor but they tried to lead a sort of sneak military attack on the then president paul kruger from betuana land or but which is now known as botswana it was very unsuccessful and all the raiders got caught and cecil john rhodes had to step down as the prime minister of south africa and was a very naughty boy but probably if he had been if he had succeeded he would have been lauded as a hero it's one of those funny things very interesting man mr rhodes very controversial figure in african history so we're going to cross through i haven't been able to swing around this vantage line yet we are going to go have a look at that vulture's nest it should be if i remember correctly so excuse me guys we're going to go through a little dip we might have a little bit of signal break up and i'll try and move through it as fast as possible better than being out in the bush as at this time of the day as the sun starts to get a little bit lower the temperature for me is almost idyllic at the moment i think a lot, uh, most people have found it a bit warm uh, but i'd much rather be hot than cold probably guess we're sitting at about 26 27 degrees which i think is uh, somewhere in the 70s oh, maybe like please don't run please don't run please don't run Don't run, little guy. Oh, he's running. We might be able to just... Here we go. Um, just through there. I'm just going to wait a few seconds. There's a tiny little grey dike here. a couple of days old. I'm going to just try to reverse a little bit. Oh, there we go. Is that the mom or the baby? The baby. The baby's coming up at the back there. The mother's out in the front. So if we reverse, we might be able to see a little bit more. There comes the baby, joining up with We've got mom, now we're just waiting for the baby to come through the thicket. Oh, oh there goes mom, and the baby's following. Oh, they've disappeared, so um, we're going to continue on to try to get the head to that vulture's nest. And in the meantime, we're going to cross across to Commander Bond, who's with some primates. Hello everybody, welcome back to Wendy. Just, we've, <laughs> we've brought you across here to look at a troop of monkeys that has, right this minute, absconded away from us. Uh, sorry about that. Uh, they are a little bit up ahead of us. Done a bit. This started looking at is is weeping. 
it's weeping it's sap and I want to taste it because I ain't tasted it before. The arm's looking a bit hungry and parched and so I'm just going to go and cut a little piece off and we're going to taste it. It's what the elephants have been eating. Oh, there's another monkey going at 150 miles an hour. Can you see here, Viam? You can see here shining gloriously like golden syrup in the sun in the sunset. We have marula sap. Viam, if I cut my hand, please pan away rapidly. The monkeys all around us that I can see, they didn't like the sight of my knife. Right, Viam, do you want to try first or shall I? What do you think? <laughs> you could see his face. I don't know if I like it or not. I. I'm slightly scared it's going to stick my feet, my face together. It's like you can't decide if it's good mm. or not. Excuse me. <laughs> Pretty tasteless, really. Mm. Not bad. Hmm? It tastes like fossilized biltong. It tastes like fossilized biltong, yes. Uh, biltong, for those of you who don't know, is uh, the equivalent of beef jerky in South Africa something of a delicacy. Mm. I don't think that's bad at all. If I was a bush baby, I'd eat that. Just remember, those of you who are at home and perhaps uh, be feeling a little peckish, don't wander about into the wilderness and start eating random tree barks. You could, could come unstuck quite quickly. I'm going to drive around this area and just see if we can't get those monkeys again. It literally disappeared as you came across to us, I'm afraid. And I'm still in the area where Kurula's tracks were last seen. Scott, who's also back from leave, I haven't seen him yet, but I've heard his um, manly tones upon the airwaves. And he is around with Jamie and they're looking for, looking also to see if they can find Karula. Who's our friend? Who? Who's our friend, Viam? Oh, look at that, the same zebras. <laughs> I suppose we'll have a quick look at them. If we don't, Viam will be insulted. So there's the same young stallion and his, um, and his Mrs. Robinson. How do you like that, Viam? I don't, like know, my, I don't have a reference to 60s pop music. <laughs> it's not pop music. I'll get back to you. I'll, I'll explain to you. And they'll go off and they'll have a bit of a feed. And they'll like to be around these areas as the night starts coming like that area she's towards where he's heading now and it's an area of silver cluster leaves and for the last few times I've seen zebra nicely on Juma that's exactly where they've been in the silver cluster leaf and I'm not I think it's probably because the water tends to be a little high this is a this time of the year So, thank, thank you, Lisa, uh, for your comment, which uh, <laughs> involved w wishing that gum that Viam and I sampled had not been peed upon by the monkeys. I truly hope it hadn't as well, Lisa. Thank you for that. We're going to head back across to Brent. 
who has got a vulture's nest apparently, which is what we were talking about just now. So he can show you the discomfort in which a white backed Wishing that gum that Viam and I sampled had not been peed upon by the monkeys. I truly hope it hadn't as well, Lisa. Thank you for that. We're going to head back across to Brent, who has got a vulture's nest apparently, which is what we were talking about just now. So he can show you the discomfort in which a white-backed vulture is expected to survive and live as a small naked chick. We'll see just now. So welcome back guys, we've made our way to this vulture's nest and I can definitely pick up a movement every now and then. So there is a baby in it and an adult in residence. Uh, we're going to sit here for a little bit and hopefully we do get a chance to see, uh, even if it is just a fleeting glimpse of the little vulture. So it's a white back vulture for those of you who might not be sure. And they're the predominant vulture species we have in this area. And also, they almost exclusively nest in knob thorns here. And it's a really, really good impregnable oh, place for the vultures to, to nest. You can see right at the top, surrounded by those vicious hooked thorns, there's very little predators that can get up there to get at their nest. So, very, very good spot for them to nest. So it's always, if you want to check on vultures' nests, you have to do it in the late afternoon or in the early, earlyish in the morning before it gets warm. Because otherwise the adults are going to be away cruising the thermals in search of carrion. So the first time I stumbled upon this nest, there was a female sitting on it. So likely she had eggs. It was quite a while ago. And it'll be interesting to see how the conservation group in Southern Africa called the Vulture Study Group. And they do surveys and check on vultures' nests all over the country. And they even have a special crew who climb up thorn trees to see and check on the health of the babies and take samples and things. And those guys are definitely braver than me. I'll happily stand down an elephant to a lion, but definitely not climb up a knob thorn. I think they're probably more like pin cushions than people. actually hear the baby making some noises there almost begging for food maybe the the adult might regurgitate there we go did you guys see that isn't that incredible follow up on the life of this little vulture. You just pick up that movement directly below her neck. say the baby's still quite young just from those movements uh, quite flailing so very uncoordinated still but obviously without being an expert knob thorn ascender it's going to be very difficult to to say
So we have it. While we're sitting here with this vulture, and you can see the, the baby lifting its head up again, begging a little bit. Uh, Cindy from Tennessee would like to know what they eat, and do both parents take care of the, the youngster? Cindy, both parents. Cindy, both parents do, um, and they will eat carrion. They will regurgitate what they've been feeding to the baby. So they will chuck it up. Um, quite often they will store extra food in their in their gullet and or crop in birds and you can quite often see when they've had a big feed that their crop is completely full and they will regurgitate meat from there for the youngster. When I found this nest I was actually with Viem and it was the first time Viem and I had ever actually been into this part of Arethusa so we were busy exploring and we've come back quite a few times and this is definitely the most action we've seen on this nest. Using things, they are directly under that nest and uh, it wasn't with Viem, I think I was with Andrew and we nearly got pooped on by that vulture as we drove underneath and I'm very glad we didn't. I'm sure that would have been a very smelly and unpleasant experience. So at the moment I can only see one chick and Diana from the northwest of England is wondering how many chicks does a vulture normally have? Well Diana, unfortunately, well it is nature though, but with most predatory birds they practice Cain and Abel syndrome or siblicide. So normally quite often two will be born and the firstborn will kill the other within minutes of birth. And the reason uh, there would be two born is to obviously give the best possible chance for one of them surviving and it's generally the first to hatch is the, the one who will survive and will kill the other. And now talking about that vulture study group, in certain circumstances with certain vulture species, if they do know of nests like white-headed vultures and cape vultures, um, they will actually remove one of, uh, one of the babies or one of the eggs and incubate it and hatch it and rear it. And that's with endangered species. So the two most endangered spe vulture species in, in South Africa are your white-headed vultures and your cape vultures or cape griffins. Oh, big thank you to Matthew, who's nine years old, who's welcoming me back from my break. Well, Matthew, it's great to be back. And Matthew, who'd like to know sort of a comparative size of a vulture? Uh, how big are they? Probably a little and a bit more muscular. And obviously slightly different to those big talons. And Matthew would like to know, would a vulture ever attack a human? Not normally, normally they would take off to try to get away from us, Matthew. But I nearly had a very big accident with a vulture once. So one of the biggest sort of threats to vultures, and they fly into them specifically during big storms and stuff, is electricity lines. And I was on my way back home late one night, and after a big thunderstorm in northern Botswana, in the small town of Maun, and my friend Richard and myself, found a vulture in the road and it had flown into a power line so it had hurt its wing so we wanted to take it to it was a rehabilitation center near town so we could get it fixed up but obviously a vulture has got a very powerful bill and very sharp talons so catching it is uh, not as easy as it sounds even though it couldn't fly from us and I was in short pants and now we're trying to get a saw. So when you try to catch these big birds like that, the sooner you can stop them from seeing, they calm down very, very quickly. So we happen to have a big sort of rugby sock, which is a really, really big sock in the car. 
and we were trying to grab the vulture and put the sock over its head so it couldn't bite us or scratch us. And it was a lot faster than we thought it was going to be. And I nearly had a very big accident and it managed to grab me very close to between my legs and hang on to my shorts for about five minutes. Fortunately, um, this enabled me to grab it by the head uh, and Richard was able to then, once we got it loose from my shorts, put the sock over its head and it calmed down. My, my younger brother and another friend of ours who were with us were actually more completely useless because we put it into the back of a pickup or a, 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 a bucky as we call them in South Africa, which is a open backed four wheel drive. And my brother and my friend Anita decided they were not being anywhere near this thing and they sat over the roof of the car even though the vulture had the sock over its head. But everyone did laugh a lot at me running around with a vulture attached to my shorts for about five minutes. But nice story about that vulture is we did manage to get it to the rehabilitation center and it made a full recovery and was released in about three weeks. As we can see how high up in that knob form that vulture nest is, I probably guess, let me work it out, it's probably 10 or 12 meters off the ground. And Lynn would like to know, do they have, baby vultures have any predators apart from snakes? In a tree like that, probably not, Lynn. The only possible predator I can think of is uh, definitely a monitor lizard, a rock monitor, would definitely, if managed to get up there they would definitely eat the eggs the other vulture babies of a different vulture not to my knowledge and they, they generally will leave them alone and they sometimes you can have quite a few nests there's about two or three nests in this area we can only see one from where we're sitting at the moment and it's the most visible but the others are far off into the bush but generally not but i think we're going to leave the little vulture family for now and we're going to go explore one of those areas of Arethusa I don't get to very often and hopefully we have some luck in those areas seeing what we can find. So we're right, right on our western boundary. So unfortunately we can't go any further that way otherwise I'm trespassing and I'm a good boy and like to stay within the rules so we won't do that. Uh, we're gonna go drive back down and underneath that vulture's nest. Hopefully we, we don't have any accidents or any bombs that drop from above as we go under. of interest in the vultures and that's wonderful they are such fascinating animals that get quite a bad rap on often and diana uh, thanks for another question diana diana would like to know whether there's a predominance in the sex of the vultures that survive diana i'm gonna have to go find out as we sneak below this nest now and hopefully we don't get bombed on I'm going to actually go around off to the wide, put the cameraman in the firing range and I'll stay on the, on the, on the outside. Um, and we're past. Um, so Dan, I actually don't know, but I, I definitely will try to find out from uh, some people I know who do, do, do quite a bit of work for the Vulture Study Group. Um, I don't know whether they are, uh, there's a sex, predominant sex ratio. Uh, I would think possibly not, but then again, I have no idea.
So obviously the vultures have to feed, so they will leave the chick. I've exposed. Alright, so they will sort of dig in under and remember there's a lot of feathers and down in there and there will be a little overlay and they will probably move into the shade uh, or little bits of the shade and as the day progresses obviously we're only during the real heat of the day and sort of high noon sun will it be directly on the on the chair. And then we saw very little um, and the apple had a little and Lynn and Jane were wondering whether the adult might have been asleep. I don't think yet. Uh, it was still awake. It was actually perched on the edge of the nest looking down on, on the chick and I think as it gets later it will move further into the We're only during the real heat of the day and sort of high noon sun will it be directly on the on the chicks. And then we saw very little um, and the apple had a little and Lynn and Jane were wondering whether the adult might have been asleep. I don't think yet. Uh, it was still awake. It was actually perched on the edge of the nest looking down on, on the chick and I think as it gets later it will move further into the nest and sort of sleep with the chick under its wings. So and when you on I'm hoping for something fantastic in this little explored area of Arethusa. I come here very very seldom and in the meantime we're going to cross to James who's with an animal that was nearly as tall as that knockthorn. Hi everybody, welcome back to Wendy. We just thought that this was the most full picture of a silhouetted magnificent old bull giraffe with a glorious very early spring sun setting just behind him. He's a magnificent old fellow. He's probably, he's probably about 22 or so. Close by, he's only about 10 meters from us, about 30 feet. Big Indian horn or sort of uh, that noticeable calcification of the skull just in front of his proper horns and behind his proper horns. A gnarled old sort of knowledgeable wizened and he's eating a couple of cambritum leaves some of them are just starting to sprout you know in fact the leaves that he's been eating are new cambritum leaves I suspect what that means is that they're not quite as full as tan of tannin as the older ones are there's normally not much will eat the cambritum Oh, yeah, couldn't have asked for better than that, huh? Beautiful. Him, I think he's very dark. Old fellow. He seems to have a slight limp on his uh, right shoulder. And I believe that our sighting is not entirely new to you, that Steph and Jamie have, in fact, spent quite a lot of time with him and noticed this limp that he has before. I'm not sure where he would have got it. He's probably tripped on something. Oh, he may just be arthritic and old, you know. Sorry, I don't want to follow him off-road and give him a fright. This is a very thick bush down through here. I think I've spent some time with this old fellow before as well, you know. But he didn't have the limp when I saw him about three weeks ago. I spent quite a long time with him just near Twin Dams. And I don't believe he had that very noticeable limp in his right shoulder. It looks like his right shoulder to me that's giving him trouble. It's the first time I've ever seen that. He's eating gory. That's amazing. So everybody, throughout this winter, I've been saying that look at the green bushes. The green bushes that you can see are gory bushes. Nothing will eat a gory bush. 
and there as you can see right now he is eating an atal gwari which perhaps is slightly less bitter than a um, than its cousin the magic gwari but it is certainly a bitter tree so that's just a testament to how little there is for him to eat I've never seen that before hmm Now the thing with too much tannin, you see, is that it starts to stop you up. Um, and indeed that's what things like black forest tea are meant to do. So if, you are, if, you, if you've got a bit of the runs, you can drink some black forest tea and it's supposed to help you with the... No, sorry, I'm talking, that's the other way around. But tannin, certainly in black tea, is supposed to help you in the stomach. Uh, but that basically means that you have to be... You can't have too much of it. It does tend to stop you up. Yeah. Let's have a look here quickly and probably keep him in picture. This is what he was eating when we arrived here. And these are new Cumbretum leaves. But they're kind of crispy new. They're not, um, they don't feel like the velvety new ones. And they taste much less tanniny than the, than the adults. Than the, than the sort of mature leaves. Hmm. Difficult times for herbivores. Hmm. Not, not very delicious, but not too bad. Hmm. I think we'll leave him peacefully grazing off there into the sunset. Gra browsing, not grazing. So Karuna's tracks, I'm afraid, have not come out anywhere where I'd hoped they would. Uh, we're still... Uh, it's getting quite dark now, so she may... Well, not dark, but it's certainly starting to cool, and it's getting a bit later, so she may start to move around. So we're still around that area. I've been driving sort of very slowly around this general area, hoping to hear um, some... Uh, not that. To, hoping to hear some alarm calls, perhaps. But nothing's popped up yet. But like I say, it has been a very nice reintroduction to the Lowfelt, a beautiful afternoon. And I believe Brent was sitting with a, a wonderful vulture's nest just after we were discussing them. And what a privilege that is. I believe there was a chick in the nest. That, of course, is a, will start to happen more and more now as we go towards the, the sort of a, the, the spring. The birds will start to breed. The weavers will get their summer plumage, beautiful bright yellows. The widers will get their long tails. And of course, all the migrants will eventually come home. And I'm sure there must be, there must have been while I was away, there must have been the sighting of a Wahlberg's eagle somewhere around here. They're, my, they're the first sort of sign for me that um, spring is on the way. Yes, there are other birds that come first, like the yellow-billed kite, but when the first Wahlberg's eagle, the flying cross, comes over the sky, it's always a bit of a thrill for me. So if, I wonder if you can tell me if anybody's actually seen one while Brent and I were away. You've got tracks there, man. I'm not sure. Could be old. We have spotted some sort of tracks, but unfortunately not Kurulas. Stop and have a listen here. I'll tell you what I can hear. I'll have a look at the sun through that gory bush and I'll tell you what I can hear. I always like to just stop and have a listen, especially as the seasons start to change, because every night there's a subtle difference in the sound. moment I can hear a drongo imitating a couple of babblers some green pigeons that's a nice new one they have been around but not calling the green pigeons go doo, 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 doo. and that drongo I don't know if you can hear it Viam can you hear it through the mic 
That Drongo is imitating a Franklin. Choo 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 choo. Can you hear that? Mostly, yeah. Very good, very good job. That's really nice to hear. And it's a beautiful ring neck dove calling behind us. Let's carry on. What a lovely evening. Mm. Nice to be back. Viam, that acacia is bleeding as well. You see that? I already ate acacia this day. Oh, gum as well. I'm just going to nip across there and compare it with the marula gum. We've had the bark a number of times, but I'm just going to see if the gum is the same. Not much gum, but there's a little bit on this bark. Don't look, turn your nose up at me like that, Biam. No, I'm to do is put all mm. this bark on. It's actually mouth. really nice. It's sweet. And there's a difference. But there it goes quite bitter. Mm. Oof. Oof. It's like the opposite of a sour worm. You know those sour sweets that you get that you mm. are initially sour and then sweet? That was very sweet to start with and then whew, unspeakably bitter. Oh. I would say it tastes like dust with a pinch of lemon. Yes, I'd say it tastes like dust with a pinch of bile. That's really not very good at all. I might have to rinse my mouth out. Excuse me. Right, well, we won't be trying that again. Like I was saying earlier, I don't think I finished. Don't go into the wilderness and try that unless you know exactly what you're eating. What were we eating? I, think... <laughs> I don't suppose I told you that, did I? Starting to get a little bit cooler now as the sun sets. And I still think that it's unusually hot for this time of year. I think it's probably two degrees hotter than it was on average over the in the years that I've been around here. It can get warm in August, but it's been hot. Oh, that was bitter. And then from Canada, as you, Kathleen, you were obviously watching us eating, eating this gum, and so you want to know if there's anything like a maple tree out here that we can tap a delicious tasting syrup out of. Uh, certainly not the knob form, um, but no, Kathleen, nothing that produces sap that makes a syrup like the maple tree. But we do have a palm called the Ilala palm, and then there's all the wild date palm and various palms that you can tap for the sap, and then you make apparently quite a nice wine. I've never tasted the wine, but you can make quite a nice wine from it. I don't think it's very strong, uh, which apparently makes quite a refreshing drink. We don't get Ilala palms in this area. Although they are two sands. And 
that just it's a interesting one Kathleen you talked about you talk about the maple and obviously that makes a very delicious syrup and I've had long discussions about cuisine and what people eat out here and why they eat what they do out here it's another good example of how um, in many parts of the world there are lots of different fruits and things that produce lots of juice and perhaps other plants that produce sap and liquids from which Time yeah. in the, in the marula tree is in fruit and you can make very delicious things from marulas uh, jams and preserves you can make quite a potent beer from them and obviously they make cure a marula cream from marula well it's very little marula in it but they do use it other than that it's not a huge amount but for very isolated in terms of delicious fruits elephants will push down trees and make areas more open or not so we're going to cross across to commander bond so he can bid you adieu and then we'll be back with these ellies for the last few minutes Hello everybody, welcome back to Wendy. We stopped in this particular area so that we would, could greet you and say goodbye for this evening. Sorry about the technical issues we've had. And then we spotted what looked like something cattish in the tree and it was in fact a monkey. A monkey. So, monkey, and that's it for this Let me back into the fold. It's wonderful to be back in the low felt. It's feeling very spring-like, which is marvelous. And a big thank you, of course, to the final control, Tara, and to the inimitable with his spectacular new beard cut uh, in the final control today. So thank you to all of you for your questions and your contributions, some lively conversations, and back and listening to you all again and speaking to you all again. I will see you again tomorrow during the dawn you tomorrow. Welcome back everyone as you can see just behind this female who's right next to us some others have come in and we're just sitting here quietly uh, in this sort of low beautiful low felt dusk and enjoying some time with some very special animals. It's great to be back here uh, on Juma and Arathusa private game reserves. It sort of feels like I'm back home now and hopefully we can get out there and start finding you guys some animals. I know James is just as excited as I am to be back. And what a wonderful way to end off on my first safari back, sitting here at the almost perfect time of the day in the most perfect temperature uh, with this beautiful little breeding herd of elephants feeding off behind me. Uh, thanks to everyone again for all the welcome backs. Thanks for all the questions. We really do appreciate them. And thanks for keeping me honest, guys. Some of those questions keep me on my toes. You guys don't even let me ease back into it. You're bang on it. But I really do appreciate it, and it is really wonderful to get them. And from Brian and myself, sitting here on the Jigger, uh, we'll see you very soon. And guys, don't forget to tune in for the sunrise as well as the sunrise, uh, sunset safaris. I know, unfortunately, some of you guys have to work and you can't make all the drives, but be sure to catch the updates uh, on YouTube or on the Wild Earth, on the Wild Earth Twitter account. Uh, from us here at Juma Private Game Reserve, have an absolutely splendid rest of your day or evening, and we'll catch you bright and early on the sunrise safari for the last few seconds, hand you back off to the real stars, our chair in the bush, the elephants. <laughs>